Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is June 13th, 2009, and my guest is John Taylor, the Mary and Robert Raymond Professor of Economics at Stanford University, and the Bowen H. and Janice Arthur McCoy Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. His most recent book is Getting Off Track, How Government Actions and Interventions Caused, Prolonged, and Worsen the Financial Crisis. John, welcome back to Econ Talk. Great to be back. Uh, our subject for today is, is your book, the Getting Off Track book and the ideas there, You argue in the book that much of the crisis that we're in the middle of uh, was due to excessively loose monetary policy. What is is the evidence for that claim? The evidence I focus on is that interest rates were much lower, especially 2003, 4, and 5, than would have been expected based on the kind of monetary policy that was used during much of the 80s and 90s when we had these long expansions and very short recessions. So it was excessively low relative to times where the interest rate policy of the Fed worked well. I measure that specifically through the Taylor Rule. You don't need to do it that way. The Taylor Rule turns out to be a pretty good description of the way interest rates were set through most of this period of the uh, long boom or the great moderation. And so that's a natural starting place. Um, and we talked so, about the Taylor Rule on a previous podcast. We'll put a link up to that, of course, but why don't you just review it again yeah, here? The Taylor Rule shows that the good monetary policy is one in which the interest rate set by the central bank adjusts by a sufficient amount when, interest, when, excuse me, when inflation rises uh, or when GDP rises or falls. And so if inflation begins to pick up, the interest rate should rise by at least as much of that inflation. And if the economy starts to go into a recession, the interest rate should be cut by certain amounts. And so then there's a quantitative amounts. So you can measure it specifically and, and therefore compare it to the period of 2003, 4, 5, when it was much lower than implied by this rule. Just again to review, I, I think it's, listeners are usually uh, confused. When you say the Fed sets an interest rate, we're talking about the federal funds rate. Right, which is the rate that banks charge each other for overnight lending. Exactly. And it doesn't literally set it. It injects reserves right. or extracts reserves to change the rate in that market process. Is that right? That's exactly right. The word set is sometimes used, and you're, you're quite correct to ask about it, uh, because the Federal Reserve Open Market Committee, the Federal Open Market Committee, the group that's assigned to, to Sherman Monetary Policy, uh, frequently votes about that rate, and therefore the language sets the rate is frequently used. But you're quite right. Effectively, they set a target, and the, the idea is that the, uh, the Fed and New York trading desks adjust the reserves or the money supply to bring the actual interest rate into line with their goal. So what you're saying is that in the 2003 to 2005 period, it was actually it was a little bit before that, um, isn't it before that? that well, it depends on how you measure it. I think it's actually such a big discrepancy. You can focus on 2002, 3, 4. Those are the, the substantial periods. It doesn't really get back to normal to the end of 2005. So, so, but there's a big gap of time where the actual interest rate is well below what would be reasonably expected based on good monetary policy in the past. Which is another way of saying that the Fed at that point, over that period, injected too much too much money into the system, into the banking system. That's the way to put it, exactly. And, and if I could say about the timing, one way to think about this is in 2004, early part of 2004, the federal funds rate was still at 1%, one percentage point. And that's really uh, you know, almost three years after the recession had ended in 2001. So you've got a long period of time where the economy is moving up, inflation is moving up, and the interest rate is still held at a very low level, uh, whether you use a rule or just look at the past in some informal way. Lowest level in, I think, the previous 40 years. Yeah. Now, why do you think they did that? Uh, 
the standard argument is, is that I, I think is that after the 9-11 attacks and the 2001 recession, uh, the Fed was worried about deflation, so they lowered interest rates to make sure that didn't happen. But they kept them there for so long. What do you think was, what do we know about what they were thinking at that time, during that time? Well, you put your finger on the main one, the concern about deflation and still worrying about the aftermath of 9-11. And you did have the dot-com bubble bursting 2000, 2001. Those are in, into the past. But I think I would characterize it this way, well-intentioned efforts to prevent uh, something worse, if you like, like a deflation or like a Japan or major downturn. And so I don't think it's a matter of, uh, of, of people with the wrong intentions. They were very much like you and me trying to do the best they could. But, uh, but based on the objective evidence, they knew they were lower than normal. And they would say the interest rate is going to be low for a considerable period. And that was, that was the reason for that. Were they worried about, do you think they were worried about the kind of effects that, that you're saying they, that that led to? For example, the housing, the rise in housing prices? Evidently not too much about the housing in particular. There, was a lot, there were discussions about it at the time. I think that um, one of the things about, about easy money, if you like, is you don't know where it's going to show up or what it's going to do. And when Milton Friedman wrote about this uh, long ago, he would talk about the ups and downs of too much money and, and too shortage of too, too little money, if you like. And uh, sometimes it would cause uh, excesses in certain areas or certain markets. You never can predict where it would be. Housing is a typical one based on the 60s and 70s. Monetary policy did induce uh, booms in housing uh, and slumps in housing. So, so it was a logical place for it to occur, but um, very hard to predict where it will occur. At your work, you focus on the federal funds rate, and I probably asked you this question before, but I'll, I'll ask you again. Uh, why is measured monetary expansion not as dramatic as we would have predicted? In other words, if you're claiming that loose monetary policy was the cause of the crisis, we actually look at, say, standard measures of, mon of money, uh, and M2 being one example. M2 growth over the period we're talking about was, you know, Large, but not didn't look dramatic. It didn't look so big. The fact that interest rates were dramatically lower than usual, okay, but that why is that so important? Why isn't the traditional measure of, of the amount of money the right thing we want to look at in, in assessing the impact? That's a very good question. I, the main reason, I would say, is that because of all the technological changes, the regulatory changes, the ability for people to make payments without the traditional forms of money, uh, money became less reliable. The traditional measures became less reliable. It doesn't mean that money didn't matter. There was a money that was mattering quite a bit, but measuring what that is, is has been difficult for a long time. In fact, that's the, one of the reasons why central bankers have focused on interest rates and one of the reasons why p policy rules like the Taylor Rule were designed, if, in a sense, to stand in for money uh, in a situation where money growth is hard to measure. But I would say you had a diff, good, some good indicators of a monetary um, excess in the rising inflation rate. Inflation overall was picking up slowly but surely during this whole period. But it's surprising that it didn't pick up dramatically. I mean, one way to think about it, this puzzle would be, yes, the federal funds rate was really low, but you know, why should that have such a big impact? And why did it have such a big impact? Are you suggesting, you know, based on your previous answer, that a lot of this money, was it the money or the price? That's a different way to say it. Was it the money or the price that overstimulated the housing market? Well, the low interest rates, uh, federal funds rate, were certainly the transmission mechanism that would be most important. And you think about this two ways. One is the low interest rate would make the rate on adjustable rate mortgages much lower. So about 30% of the mortgages during this period were adjustable rate. In fact, the fraction it was increasing. Grew dramatically over this time. It was increasing rapidly. And so that meant the possibility of the teaser rates, very low initial rates, which would then rise later. So that obviously reduced the uh, cost of buying a house and increased the demand. Um, 
moving up along the demand curve. And then the second thing, though, is there is a term structure of interest rates that are important. They're important, and especially longer-term mortgages, 30-year mortgages, depend on longer-term interest rates. So there you have to think about the transmission mechanism is that the short rates feed through to the long rates. And that's always been a, a rather circuitous, if you like, uh, channel with a lot of uncertainty. And here there, was, there were puzzles. Uh, Alan Greenspan calls this a conundrum as long rates didn't seem to be moving up as they might have in the past. But that, of course, could have been that the rates had been so excessively low that people were fooled. You're talking about in the period when he started to raise rates. Uh, why didn't Right. The long rate respond. Right. If you look at, we don't have a chart here on our podcast. Uh, we don't have a chart mechanism, but but if you look at the data, what you see is that the long term rate and the short term rate are falling steadily throughout the first part of the twenty first century in the two thousand and two to two thousand and five ish right period. But the difference between them starts to grow. The short term rate starts to fall faster than the long term rate, making short term rates particularly attractive over this period. So that's part of the problem for these adjustable rate mortgages that a lot of people were, were, were right. dealing with at the time. But there is this puzzle as to why long-run rates were falling even as short-run rates started to climb up at the end of this period, right? And that's right. the conundrum. That's the conundrum. Now, my feeling about the conundrum is that the main reason for this was that people in the markets were somewhat unsure about what the Fed was going to do. After all, they were doing something very unusual in this period, so when were they going to raise rates and how fast were they going to raise rates? They were excessively low. Were they moving away from, in a more permanent way, the policies of the 80s and 90s? So I think a lot of that longer-term rate adjustment uh, was uh, a surprise for that reason. Now, others have claimed that uh, that long-run decline uh, and the problems that you talk about were not the fault of the Fed, but we're due to other causes. So Alan Greenspan, who is uh, indicted in this indictment that you're putting forward, has, has defended himself with a couple of different arguments. Uh, one of them, or at least I don't know if he's put this far, others have, is that, that these long-term trends in interest rates had nothing to do with the Fed. They were due to world savings rates, a, a phrase I hate, a so-called glut in savings. I'll just call it an expansion of savings. Um, what do you think of that argument? Well, it's got some factual problems, as stated that way, and that is that the overall global savings rate uh, was lower than normal in that period, at least it had been lower than the 70s and lower than the 80s and lower than most of the 90s. So global savings rates, as best measured, were low. So it's hard to see a excess. Now, um, Alan Greenspan, of course, is very well aware of that, and so what he will say is that it's not so much the measured rates that you're looking at. After all, saving has to equal an investment. What is important is the intended savings being greater than intended investment or desired saving being greater than desired savings. The problem with that is it's really not possible to measure it. And so it becomes more, more of, a, of, a, of an argument that uh, doesn't, is really hard to, to, to substantiate. So, but I think ultimately those measured rates being so low raise lots of questions about that as the explanation. Now, so to summarize, in your view, the, the overexpansion of housing securities, investment in housing, housing construction in the early part of the 21st century that led to this crisis, particularly in the subprime market, was due to overexpanded monetary policy and particular deviations from either the Taylor rule, if you might you could call it, or um, just the past behavior of the Fed. Correct? Yes, yes that's, the, that's the basic beginning. Of course, there are other things that fed into that. that yeah, tell showing. me some of those. Well, one thing I would point to is that those low rates themselves encourage some excess risk-taking. Uh, for example, the, as, with the low rates and the increased demand for housing, the price of housing would start to rise even more than it was in the past. Those high inflation rates for housing would give people more incentive to make their payments. Housing prices are rising. Uh, or less incentive to, to default or go delinquent. And, but, uh, and so that would mislead, if you like, underwriters into thinking these are good investments uh, less risky than you'd think, and so investments were made. Uh, 
assuming that they were less risky. So in a sense, it encouraged the risk-taking itself. Of course, when housing prices started to, to uh, level off and actually fall, that all reversed, and, and uh, payments went down, uh, delinquencies went up, and foreclosures went up as well. So that's one of the channels, but that's still related to those low interest rates. Another, of course, is the encouragement of the purchases of risky assets through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which, which was a big part of the uh, expansion of, of the subprime and others. Talk about that, because a lot of people on different side of the ideological spectrum would have argued that they had really nothing to do with it. So what role do you think Fannie and Freddie played? Well, I think they played a substantial role. There was a lot of efforts to rein them back in. There were people, including Alan Greenspan, uh, it was very clear that these were uh, creating a lot of risk. Uh, They're expanding very rapidly at a time where the housing is, is in a boom. So sort of the, the, uh, the evidence is pretty clear that the, the, the expansion is related to this. Um, I don't think it's... A, I don't think ideological uh, positions are the way to think about this. It seems to me the more you can have the evidence, the more that you can have the data, the better off you can be. One of the reasons I don't dwell on this as much as the low interest rates or the inducement to um, search for yield and therefore take on more risk is, quite frankly, we don't have as much evidence as in these other areas. So, but I think if you ask my opinion, I think it would be, it's a very significant part of it. But they were not involved directly in subprime lending. They were involved, which I think is part of the reason people are quick to uh, ignore their role, right? They, it, they did get entangled in it. All, it's, it's not... Through, uh, the, through the securitization. Correct. Talk, really, talk really. about that. Well, of course, the uh, thing that has made this financial crisis so mysterious and difficult is a lot of the mortgages originally issued were put together in the form of mortgage-backed securities, so that they could be sold, and then those mortgage-backed securities were divided into tranches of different risk levels, and then they were mixed with other tranches from other mortgage-backed securities, and so within those, you had subprime mortgages. And so indirectly, when Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac purchased one of these securities, it was, it was supporting the subprime market. Right, and they, they were actually, again, this is not well known, or at least not everybody knows it, or at least some people think it's not true, but it is. They were, although they were not bundling subprime mortgages, uh, at least initially, into their own securities. They, at the beginning of the explosion of the subprime market, were a non-trivial portion of the demand for those securities. They were using those to satisfy their affordable housing requirements that HUD imposed on them starting in 1992. And as you point out, one of the frustrations of this question for me is how little we know about that, uh, the magnitudes. I've seen estimates. Mm-hmm. It's in the hundreds of billions of dollars, but it's shocking how difficult it is to get good, est- good, reliable estimates of how involved they were. I but agree. They- I agree. So, my, in fact, one of the reasons I think we should have, uh, you know, a sub- systematic investigation of this whole crisis is to get that information. I tend to look at areas where I have the numbers and the data, and therefore can do something objective. But there's a lot more to be done in terms of obtaining the information and the data. Let me talk, ask you about two other areas where I know you've done the investigation. Uh, one is, or at least looked at others' investigations carefully, one is, one of the things that's attractive about your explanation and that is unattractive about the explanations that rely, say, solely on Fannie and Freddie or um, other particular favorite causes that people trot out is that the housing bubble was not just an American phenomenon, and that is... Uh, something that every explanation of this crisis has to come to grips with if they're going to be taken seriously. So we had rapid increases in the price of housing in the United States, but we also saw them in Ireland, Spain, I think South Africa. Um, right. So why did those happen, and how are they tied into your explanation? Well, I'm glad you raised that because uh, – so, so Surprisingly, maybe amazingly, people who have looked at my work on the United States and the rates being lower than the so-called Taylor Rule, they went out and looked at other countries, and in particular some research at the OECD in Paris. They looked at OECD countries, and they looked at countries whose interest rate was below the Taylor Rule as they estimated in the different countries, and found an amazingly high correlation between the deviations and the housing price boom, if you like, the housing price boom, 
or housing boom more generally in other countries. So that would include Spain, it would include Ireland. And, um, and so there's evidence that this works globally, absolutely. I to me, one of the, if you want one of those things, you do research and then later someone comes around and says it's, it holds up in other countries and you begin to see, hey, there's something more to it than you even thought yourself. That's only one study. It's, it's, it's yes. early. I mean, I think that's, that's a fundamental issue Absolutely. that people are going to continue to look at. But it raises a question that I don't think they talk about in that, because I've looked at that paper also, and I wonder if you've thought about it, which is the global uh, transmission mechanism for money. Uh, it's tempting, and I think wrong, I presume, to think about, well, Ireland has a monetary policy, and Spain has a monetary policy, and South Africa has a central bank, and America's got a central bank, and they're adjusting interest rates. But, of course, interest rates uh, have an increasingly global character, and it's – how well do we understand that? How well do we understand a particular – just the thing I'm thinking about is yeah. the role of the U.S. alone as being a rather large um, – Elephant, uh, pick your favorite animal, gorilla, I'm not sure, 900-pound gorilla, <laughs> elephant hiding in the corner. The U.S. interest rate market and, and the monetary policy of the Fed must have effects beyond the United States. Uh, do we, what do we know about that? Or are we just a small No, no, we have, small a big, we have big effects. As, uh, I, I spent a lot of years building a multi-country model with the U.S., uh, Expansion of money would have a big effect abroad, and uh, but also expansion in Europe would have big effects in other countries. Uh, there is uh, various channels of transmission: is exports, uh, imports, which depend on exchange rates, which of course are influenced by monetary policy. You have capital flows that move according to interest rates, which are influenced by monetary policy. So there's huge connections. But one of the fascinating things about early research in this area is that. If each central bank did what was right for its country, that is, U.S. kept its inflation rate low and, and um, cre- tried to create stability, the ECB in Europe did the same thing, then you'd have just a, a very good world performance. In other words, each country doing its own thing would prevent, if you like, instability and inflation more broadly. I think that's largely still true, even though the world is more globalized, as you say. But but it's more complicated as it becomes globalized. And one example of that is the, the tendency for central banks to follow each other. And if the U.S. has a low interest rate, it will tend to mean that small open economies, British, for example, or the Swedish, will have lower, they will choose lower interest rates too. And they do that to some extent because they're worried about their exchange rate. If the U.S. cuts its interest rate and uh, Riksbank Bank uh, does not, then it's going to cause the Swedish currency to appreciate, and then that could could uh, have other ramifications in Sweden. So there's definitely a, a relationship, and I, that's one of the reasons why I think that you should think about this more globally now, and perhaps even think about a global inflation goal in some sense, that uh, you, know, you, you need to think about having global inflation low. That doesn't mean you need to have uh, much coordination between monetary policy, but just to look that to make sure each central bank is not trying to make life difficult for uh, its counterparts. Let, let's move away from monetary policy and come to another issue, which I think, again, uh, your book is has a very unusual and uh, thought-provoking perspective on, which is the role of intervention generally and the government's role in the, in the prolonging or shortening of the crisis. If we go back to last um, fall a year ago, fall of 2008, uh, fall of 2008, uh, we saw, if you go back to March, we saw the beginning of unprecedented intervention on the part of the Fed and the, tre- and the Treasury. And so we had the Bear Stearns um, takeover, marriage, whatever you want to call it, in March, and then we had the crisis in the fall that really kicked things off, unfortunately. And that was... Uh, the Fannie and Freddie uh, bankruptcy collapse takeover, um, and the failure to bail out Lehman Brothers, which was really the only major uh, financial institution that has not been bailed out, right? We've seen forced takeovers of Merrill Lynch by Bank of America that has led to all kinds of other issues, the enormous amount of money we poured into AIG, all designed at the time and justified at the time without much explicit justification, but justified at the time that without these 
effects. Without these interventions, uh, we would have a frozen credit market and disaster. Uh, a lot of people say, and I know you and I are both skeptical of that, and a lot of people on the other side say, well, but, but look at Lehman Brothers. After we let Lehman Brothers fail, that's when the thing really got serious. And that was, the, that was a, a mistake on the other side. We, we, should, we should have bailed them out too. But you, are, you give a very uh, suggestive and interesting analysis of the Lehman Brothers bailout. Uh, talk about what, what your analysis of that is. So I, I think if you look closely at the timing of the panic in the fall of 2008, and it was a panic. You had a huge drop in stock markets. Uh, uh, the S&P 500 goes down uh, 28% in three weeks. You have huge uh, increase in interest rate spreads in the money markets. Most of those movements occurred at least 10 days or two weeks after the Lehman Brothers uh, bankruptcy. And they also occur at time at a time where the, the U.S. government, at least, is out there saying we need to intervene with a TARP program uh, or the, there'll be disaster, if you like. If you like, uh, trying to sell it to the Congress and the American people, uh, I think to some extent by uh, scaring, which did scare. And, and then you see globally, you see a huge uh, drop in exports in many countries. It hit, hit very severely. So I find it hard to relate to Lehman Brothers, quite frankly. The credit flows don't, are not enough to, to have such a disruption. Now, obviously, it's around the time of Lehman Brothers, so you can't discard that. So one way I think you might want to think about it is that... Right, because everyone could be, well... After sleeping on it for 10 days, I think people got really scared when they saw that Lehman yeah. Brothers would it happen. Was, sure, yeah, we could be true. that out, or it took a while for them to see where all the counterparties were. And need more work on that, to be sure. I think, the, the, to me, this goes back to some more theory here, and that is what I observe in, in disruption in financial markets are surprises, uh, where you can't discount an event. You saw that in the financial crises in emerging markets, uh, in the uh, in the 90s, uh, it was a surprise not to bail out Russia. So it had a huge impact globally. It was it was uh, if if you like a surprise not to bail them out, and and that caused a disruption. And then in Argentina, there was less much less disruption, which wasn't a surprise. So it seems to me the problem with Lehman was it was a surprise after the Bear uh, intervention, which you mentioned, Bear Stearns, and other things that people said, there was a great expectation that, that the Lehman Brothers would be intervened and bailed out. And when it wasn't, that was a surprise. People weren't ready. So the counterfactual, I think, is that right after Bear Stearns, perhaps, a, a good explanation of what the policy was could have been put forth, and I think that would have reduced uh, the impact of, of not intervening with Lehman Brothers substantially. It would not have been as much of a surprise. So I think that's the kind of research that we need to do. I'm convinced that the more that the government can be clear and predictable about its policy, the less surprises there'll be like that, the less contagion there is some, from such surprises. And um, that's the lesson I get from this whole crisis, quite frankly. Do you think the Fed and the Treasury during that time period had an alternative policy, given the state of things at the time, and in particular the counterparty relationships, given how linked together, uh, Bear Stearns, Lehman, AIG, Merrill, et cetera, all were. Was their concern a legitimate one that had we done nothing and those firms had gone bankrupt, uh, it would have been catastrophic? Or do you think that's... Um, well, not first true? of all, I'm not, I wasn't there. So let me just be clear about that. When you're inside, it's, it looks different. I was inside for some of the events I just described internationally, uh, Argentina, Brazil, et cetera. And so it's different from you on the inside, so it's very difficult to second-guess. I hesitate to do that. But what it seems to me it, um, it would have been possible to do is, say, Bear Stearns was a surprise. Suppose there's nothing else they could have done. I think at that point, articulating a strategy, even if it's a general description, uh, not precise, then it would give people some sense of, uh, of a coherent strategy. But there tended to be more of ad hoc responses from one event to another. Again, I really hesitate to, um, to to any Monday morning quarterback in here because you don't know what people knew. But I would also add one thing. I think for policymakers, and again, I've been there, uh, 
um, it's very hard to say no in these circumstances because you don't get much reward uh, if you say no and things uh, work fine. Right. You know, so what? Just what did he do? Nothing. He just said no. You get huge penalty if you say no and things uh, do fall apart. And so there's a strong incentive to uh, to go ahead and say yes, and that reduces the short run damage. Long term, it can cause a lot of difficulties. In fact, I think we're seeing that right now. Right now, we have uh, a bailout mentality. Yeah. It's hard to see who we wouldn't be, be bailing out. We're, we're also extending it to uh, automobile companies, uh, insurance companies, and uh, that's not a healthy situation. So once you go down this road, it's very hard to reverse. I would, again, just make an analogy with emerging markets. There was a lot of interventions and bailouts in the 90s. That was the mentality until 2002, 2003 or so. And that sort of changed. And the IMF didn't bail out as much, and the U.S. didn't support it. But it took a long time to get to that situation. And I, I would think the ad hoc problem is always going to be there because... If you're, a, if you're bearing the responsibility, if you're that policymaker, ad hoc's really appealing. Right? Announcing a policy that you might, a set of general rules say, limits your flexibility um, and ties your hands, and therefore you're likely to be in a situation where you're going to want to say yes when you're going to have to say no by your rules. So better to say ad hoc, and, or as it's positively called, flexible. <clears throat> so that's what we did. We've had a flexible policy, right? Yeah. Well, certainly, it's certainly the, the momentum in that direction, but that's why we make policy making difficult. And that's why you, we, that's why we have to worry about it. That's why you have rules for monetary policy. That's why you have uh, constitutions. Uh, it's, it's basically a rules based society. The more you can do that, the better. You have to have flexibility, absolutely. But um, I think we've gone way too far in the other direction at this point. And uh, p- people you choose. The more knowledgeable they are, the more they can say to some group, say, this world's going to be a disaster if you don't bail us out. You know, that's so easy to say. Yeah. You have to have the experience and the knowledge and the, and the confidence that this is the right thing. This is in the public interest to say no. That's what you're there for, is for the public interest. But given the in- inevitable political nature of, of these institutions, all of them, the Treasury, Fed, any of them, what are the implications for what we might do now what has been proposed and we don't talk about legislation on this show but what's been proposed is in general an expansion of of uh power to the fed and it would seem to me that your your view which is that the fed has been part of the problem requires that the fed let's forget about the regulatory slash oversight role let's talk about pure monetary policy what might we think about as a change in the Fed that would reduce the chances of this kind of disaster happening again, where interest rates are, quote, too low, too long? I think the main thing is to learn from this experience to see what happens when you did that. And more specifically, uh, you could think about the very low rates that I complained about before as an effort to do, if you like, uh, do too much fine-tuning. In a way, it's kind of like the perfect becomes the enemy of the good. You try to overdo it, even do better than you did the last 20 years. And this, my analysis says, no, that was good. You tried it, okay, but it didn't work. And so come back to sort of the basic fundamentals of what worked and let that guide policy. So, So that's not so much a political question there. It's almost a technical question, right? Learning from that experience, uh, learning from that extra effort to fine-tune, and don't try to fine-tune so much, and we'd be better off. So I think that's the best way to think about monetary policy, is there are advantages to rules. Uh, politics can in, get in the way, and there will get in the way more with some of the regulatory proposals we're seeing at this point. But in the meantime, I think uh, you can learn a lot from these lessons. But the political pressures are going to be there no matter what. If you think about the next crisis where people are worried about deflation, it's hard to imagine that someone's going to say, well, back in 2002 or three, we kept rates too low for too long. They're going to say, I don't want deflation and depression on my watch. And you know, Russ, we had t- almost over 20 years of policy with long expansions and short recessions. Uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, complaining when the Fed raised rates. Of course, there's the usual amount. Um, there was, um, it can be done. 
It's it's not that yet. Sometimes it requires people to get started, like a Paul Volcker, with a lot of courage and brings it through. And and I I praise Alan Greenspan for most of that period. I think he kept uh, inflation low. And the last part of this was, I think, uh, more of a uh, the perfect becomes the enemy of the good, if you like. But but it's possible. It's not that difficult, quite frankly. It seems to me. It, it's it's going to be difficult to get back to that. But we have love, and not just the United States. Good economic performance in many countries, especially in the in the late nineties and late eighties and nineties. Well, let's move to that interim period, the one we're in right now. Um, the Federal Reserve has accumulated an enormous uh, number of assets. Uh, its balance sheet is. Um, I think close to a trillion started in the small numbers of billions uh, a year or so ago, and now it's hundreds of billions, close to a trillion. I think about half of that, a little over half of that, is mortgage-backed securities that they purchased, which is something that hasn't gotten much coverage. People just talk about them accumulating assets. Now, when they're doing that, they're injecting reserves into the banking system. There's an enormous number of excess reserves into the banks, the banking system, which would suggest, as Alan Meltzer has on this program, that when the economy recovers and banks feel a little more optimistic and confident about the future, that money is going to be lent out and we're going to have substantial inflation. Is that your prediction as well, or do you think there's an alternative that's uh, less destructive? It's my worry for sure. The alternative is the Fed will remove those reserves in time. That's what you hope for. I, I'm, I'm worried about it politically. We've I've also uh, warned about this problem and written about it, and the response from the Fed is, don't worry, we'll be able to pull these reserves back. They talk like they've got a big mop in the back room there. It's like that that metaphor, right? (laughs) There's too many reserves are sloshing around, but don't worry, we've got a big mop in the back, we're just going to mop them up. uh, Much easier said than done. And I think one reason is the mortgage-backed securities uh, that you mentioned, and, and other similar kinds of back, asset-backed securities that they'll be purchasing. Um, those are very hard to, to, to unmop, if you like. It means you've got to sell the mortgage-backed securities, and people are going to be saying that's going to raise mortgage rates. So I think it's very hard. I actually would have been trying to do some counterfactual simulations that have supposed the Fed already had gotten rid of all those mortgage-backed securities. How would things look? And to me, to me it would be just fine if they even didn't even purchase so many of them. So I'm uh, quite worried about it. I also think it raises questions about the Fed's independence. It's also buying medium-term treasuries to try to keep longer-term treasury rates low, medium-term treasury rates low. Um, that raises questions about its independence, trying to reduce treasury borrowing rates. So these are uh, really important questions, and I think we sh- more people should know about it. Um, they're very, it's very arcane when you talk about reserve balances and the balance sheet of the Fed. Everybody's eyes glaze over very quickly. Not many people in Congress know about it. So it's, it's a very important topic, and um, I'm worried about it. How do you think the Fed's... What, let me say it differently. What do you think the impact of that has been, of those, those purchases? Uh, you know, a lot of people... I often think of macroeconomics uh, as ex post storytelling, and we're in the very big ex post storytelling phase right now. Um, things are not so good, but they could be a lot worse. So there's some, perhaps, congratulations to go yes. around, and monetary economists say, oh, see, monetary policy is very important. The Fed has, because of its extensive interventions, has introduced a lot of liquidity into the into the market, and that's what kept this from plunging off a cliff last last fall when when pan- the panic was setting in. Others would say, no, that had nothing to do with it. They're pushing on a string. All we have left is fiscal policy, and the only reason things didn't go off a cliff is because of the uh, administration's uh, stimulus package. Even though it hasn't done enough, they say, well, at least it, it changed expectations. Any thoughts on that? Well, fiscal policy, I have a lot of thoughts on. In fact, it seems to me that's part of my story. The large interventions, uh, starting with the stimulus package in February 2008, which I don't think did much good at all. You pay, said, the Bush, the first that was the, the That was the Bush uh, stimulus package, yes. Stimulus called the Stimulus Act of 2008. Uh, and, uh, a lot did of, nothing, a lot actually. Of very, uh, nothing. I have a, <laughs> a chart in my book. I can't show it either, but it's very convincing that nothing. And then so far, the stimulus package of 
2009. It seems to me in the same boat at this point, very little uh, impact. So I think your broader question here is, I think this to me is more evidence that, um, in a sense, a lot of this was policy-induced, unfortunately. Uh, the initial monetary side, the, if you like, the scare and the panic. Fortunately, when the panic is over, things stabilized long before the, the uh, packages were put forth. Uh, monetary policy needs to be evaluated. I've done some evaluation of the impact of mortgage-backed securities purchases. I find a very small impact, quite frankly. So, um, that's, when you say small impact, yeah. what do you mean? The Fed improved the balance sheets of, of the banking system, right, through those purchases. W when you say a small impact, what do you mean exactly? Yeah, I'll try to. So there's. Let's take the purchases of mortgage-backed securities as one component of their actions. So the idea is you buy mortgage-backed securities, and that drives up their price and drives down their yield, drives down the interest rate, and therefore makes mortgages um, more attractive, reduces rates on mortgages. Mortgage rates did fall, and so you could be tempted to say that those purchases drove down the rates. But if you look more carefully, the movement of the rates is probably due to something else, and I have some data that shows it's due to perceptions of risk related to these mortgage-backed securities. And when you bring those risk numbers into account, the purchases of the securities by the Fed doesn't do very much at all. It's, it's caused by other factors. Same thing's true of the, of the uh, interbank spreads in the money market. It's, you can't see impacts of the Fed's purchases on those. Um, and so the more you do this, you say, well, we don't have direct evidence that these actions did anything. People can still argue they did something, or as you say, things could have been worse. I have a, a little story I like to tell about that, if I might. My wife bought me golf clubs for my birthday. You've heard this story. I like I it. I've read the story. Yeah. This is a, yeah. for, for, for listeners, this is a very uh, this is a profound story. Go ahead. <laughs> Well, my wife bought me uh, golf clubs for my birthday a few years ago, and uh, they were going to improve my game, of course, and had these you know, special clubs with huge drivers. You couldn't help but get a Titanium, good Titanium, special yeah, materials, all this fancy stuff. aerodynamically and, designed, and I'm so sure. so after a few years, turns out my game didn't get any better. But I still thank my wife because, of course, if I didn't have these clubs, my game would have gotten a lot worse. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, there you are. There's yeah. the uh, post hoc ergo propter hoc. Yeah. Uh, even when nothing happens, right. yeah, post hoc ergo propter hoc means after this, therefore because of this, a confusion of correlation with uh, causality. And I know our listeners have uh, heard <laughs> me talk about this many times, but it's such a difficult issue in macroeconomics uh, and economics in general to put blame or credit where it might be possibly due. I'm confused about your transmission mechanism, though, about the, the mortgage-backed security purchases. Mm -hmm. I always thought the argument was the following. The Fed has as its main tool the federal funds rate, but when that goes close to zero, the people say, well, then the Fed's impotent. It can't really do anything. So I always thought the idea was the so-called quantitative easing was that by accumulating other assets, besides injecting reserves into the system and pushing down the federal funds rate, Fed has other ways to inject reserves into the system. It can buy, buy anything. So as long as it can uh, buy these assets, in this case the mortgage-backed securities that were on banks' balance sheets, they're going to push reserves into the system, increase liquidity, and stimulate the economy. I always thought that was the argument, not through, say, the interest rate on mortgages that you were talking about in, in that story. I would say it's more... And that's the Japanese... Yeah. You know, once the Japanese right. finally figured out that... that they, you didn't just have to play with interest rates, that they could have, monetary policy can always have an effect. Basically I, printing money. And I agree it can. <laughs> I agree it can. And, but actually the United States version of quantitative easing is, is not of that variety. Okay. It's of the variety I mentioned where there's purchases of certain kinds of securities trying to affect their yields directly, mm -hmm. whether it's medium-term treasuries or mortgage-backed securities or interbank, longer-term interbank rates, LIBOR rates. Uh, and the more general kind of quantitative easing does not has not characterized this this uh, episode in the United States. And one way to think about that, Russ, is that we started expanding our balance sheet when the interest rate was still at 2%. Mm -hmm. yeah. It wasn't at zero. Right. We started, in the week of September 17th, we started 
increasing the balance sheet dramatically, very rapidly. About, when you say we, you don't mean you and me. Uh, you mean the we Fed. We mean the United States, our <laughs> yeah. country, yeah, thanks. our government. I just want to clarify that. Our government, I wish yes. my balance sheet were growing like that, but it's not. <laughs> yeah, it's going the other direction. Our government, <laughs> and, uh, but it was at, um, again, not at zero. It, did, it was driven to zero by this expansion, just as you pointed out at the beginning. You expand reserves in the money supply that will drive the interest rate to zero. But the Federal Open Market Committee didn't even vote to reduce the rates uh, before this expansion occurred, but it, yeah. it, it drove the rate to zero. And it's funny because when you mentioned the, the low rates being caused by other things, I always presumed uh, that rates were low, uh, remain low because of the persistence of the federal government in keeping Fannie and Freddie afloat and channeling money into Fannie and Freddie, which meant that banks could continue to lend it relatively low rates, which is politically popular and economically foolish right now, it seems to me. Uh, well, we've got a little time left. I'd like to get your thoughts on the state of macroeconomics. Um, where do we stand? What have, is it too early to draw some lessons from this crisis uh, for macroeconomic theory and our, our understanding of, of economics and I probably asked this last time, but it's it's always a good question. You know, when the Great Moderation was in its heyday, a lot of folks say, well, we solved that. <clears throat> we know how to run an economy, and we don't have to worry about the business cycle anymore. They're all they're going to be small and modest in the future. This is, you'd think, would, the last 18 months would cause some kind of um, soul-searching. Have you done any that you want to share with us? I'm sure you have, but that you're comfortable sharing with us. And, and where do you think the field's going to go uh, down, the, down the road. I can tell you my own view, and I think this episode uh, confirms the view that the great moderation uh, was due to good monetary policy and a, and a better understanding of the impact of monetary policy. After all, once we got off of that policy, things went to hell in a handbasket. So you have, uh, to me, it's another piece of evidence that that kind of monetary policy that we were using and our understanding of the importance of expectations and the importance of uh, understanding how the macroeconomy works, as we've been doing, is basically was right. The problem is we got off of that, and as soon after we got off of that, things got bad. It's like in the 70s. We were, were off of that. We were following a bad policy. Things were terrible. In the 80s and 90s, basically good. Good policy, good results. Now, bad policy, bad results. So from my own perspective, that's what I see. That's why I am trying to speak out so strongly that I think the deviation from those policies was really what happened. And, and I think I have a lot of evidence. I have a lot of models and I have a lot of data. How, your question is more broadly, what's going to happen to the field? And here, I don't know. I mean, there, there's uh, a lot of interest in the impact of financial markets in macro policy. My colleagues are doing research on that. I think that's good, right? Because sure. we maybe got too simplistic in our modeling and the the financial system is complicated. People didn't understand the details. There were some ramifications of that that uh, people are still trying to really understand. They don't. Uh, all these um, derivative securities and their complexities. So I'm, I'm hoping that our discipline will move in that direction to become more realistic. But I don't see at this point, my own view is that we need, a, need to have quantitative easing as a major focus of monetary policy or that we need to think about mortgage-backed security purchases as an element of monetary policy. Those seem to me the things represent a deviation. We should try to get away from it. I guess the pessimism would be that evidently it's harder than it looks, right? You'd think we'd have learned from the 70s that a certain style of monetary policy was effective. You'd think we'd learn from this episode that we've been discussing that things would get better. Um, it's not obvious, right? It's not clear that the kind of, um, let, me, let me say it differently. I'm pretty confident that if John Taylor were the next head of the Fed, we'd have some good economic times. You really don't want to have an institution that depends on getting the right person uh, into position. And um, I, it strikes me that the that the political and incentives, the political incentives facing the head of the Fed are not going to change, and we are prone to this kind of catastrophic mistake, right? If you go back to the 20th century, what was the largest mistake we made was the Great Depression. It's tempting to say, I used to say it myself, that, well, you know, we didn't understand monetary policy very well, and 
a strong case can be made that that destructive period in American economic history was due to misbehavior by the Fed or a misunderstanding, but we're smarter now. But we did it again. Not as not bad so far, I hope, right? Do you think there's really a chance it can get better down the road? Well, you know, it doesn't even mean getting better. Does it? Just to go back to my point, doesn't it mean getting back to what we were doing? In the uh, period before the Great Depression, it was not nirvana. Uh, we had lots of business cycles and right. panics. Yeah. Um, well, they were, sh- they were often uh, short. Obviously not as, not as bad as the Great Depression. Well, 1894 was a bad one, I, as far as I understand it. But, but, it, but it, uh, at this point, it seems to me we have evidence from the United States and many other countries. In fact, a lot of the emerging market countries' success now, despite being so, so heavily hit by this crisis, has been that they've been on these kinds of basic Brazil, Turkey, much more than they would have been in the past. So... So I, I agree with you that uh, it's a political system and, and it requires good individuals. By the way, I don't think we're ever going to be in a situation where, where, where good leadership in a democracy is not important, right? You have yeah. to have the good presidents, have to have good cabinet members, good members of Congress. The more you have that, the better. We're never going to be completely on automatic pilot in our country. That doesn't make any sense. But um, the more that... The institutions can um, build some of this uh, uh, philosophy into them. Maybe it's more inflation targeting. You know, maybe it's a different degree of, of, of independence for the Fed. Uh, maybe going back to your earlier question, we have to worry about a little more on the international coordination, ultimately uh, change in the monetary system and globally. But uh, those, those things uh, are never going to remain the same. But I, I do think that uh, the lessons learned here uh, can be useful, and that the politics, in some sense, at the most basic level, if the American people understand it, uh, they'll respond. All right now, you see a lot of skepticism in, in, in the Congress about some monetary policy, quite frankly. Maybe people are beginning to say, hey, maybe there were some problems here and they can be adjusted. Hopefully, they'll be in the right direction. Yeah, I'd say this is the, the level of you know, you talked earlier about people's eyes glazing over when you talk about Fed balance sheets, and mine used to glaze over too, but now I find myself looking at them, and I'm not alone. Uh, there are a lot of people looking at them, right? Oh, yeah. When you have the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and the other forms of mainstream media putting up charts that show them and how they change over time, and yeah, it's, uh, true. it's, it's, it's a stunning it, difference. It is. It's really... So that's, that's good. I mean, people are getting involved and thinking about it as long as it doesn't become... Uh, misplaced, and, and we do the wrong thing. But well, that, I'm, I'm confident in our system that that can that can be beneficial. Yeah, I hope so. Although it's interesting, I, I agree with you. It, it, there has never been a time in our lifetime where there's been so much skepticism about the role of the Fed. Right? There's always been people who thought the Fed was some sort of international conspiracy. Um, uh, manipulating things. That view is much more widely held than it's ever been. But they're also mainstream folks saying that something has to be done. I think the challenge is it's not obvious what it would be. Um, you know, you said that maybe more independent, less. It's very difficult to think about how you might structure rules or, you know, back in the old days, Milton Friedman would talk about a, you know, automatic pilot, you know, auto, a, fixed a, money growth, fixed yeah. money growth, which quote could be done by a computer. That would be an extreme of just lack of, of change of discretion to, to a rule-based system. Uh, it's not clear that there are any structural changes. not clear to me. I, do you have any thoughts on this, though, how the Fed might be changed? I mean, a lot of people say we should go to a lot, more than before, not a lot. More than before, people say, we've got to think about a gold standard. We've got to think about stripping the monetary role of the government out of the Fed. Let's well, say price rules and things like that. Right. Well, actually, I, I do think that some kind of rule-based thinking about the interest rate, or whatever their interest instrument happens to be when we're out of this, is, is a productive way to think about things. After all, again, go back to my research. Policy rules, we're doing a pretty good job as guidelines, right? And you don't have to be perfect, but they do help. I think it's hard to legislate that, but you could imagine some kind of a... Uh, something a little more, if you like, than it's a pure inflation target. Maybe something that, that, that says something about the movements of the instruments. Uh, I don't, we're not there yet, but it seems to me it's certainly uh, something to, to think about. But actually, in the shorter run, we have a more productive way to do this, and that is 
not to give the Fed a lot more responsibility yeah, well, because true. they're being asked to by certain legislative changes to take on more roles, and I think that, my own view is that's counterproductive to this overall goal. Of course, if you're right, cultural policy, cultural effects, norms, stigma, uh, pressure of various kinds would play a role as well. And I'm wondering, during this time that we're discussing, the 02 to 05 period, I presume that you were telling the Fed that they were doing the wrong thing. Well, I have the Taylor Rule, which is sufficient for that purpose, uh, quite frankly. Um, but other, what I'm thinking is that if most economists, certainly most macroeconomists, had agreed with you during the time that the Taylor Rule was the road to, to stability and growth, there would have been pressure on the Fed, or if the people thought that that was true. So I guess... It was it's interesting. There weren't as many as you might think. I mean, one of the... The common commentators, Wall Street Journal editorial pages, which were very much on top of this all through this period, and and you can point to others as well. But you know, like so many things leading up to this crisis, just a few people you can point to that were were talking about it. And uh, it could be simply that the um, is one of those things that builds up quickly, and before you're before you know it, you're there. So it, it was a little a little slow. I think it in many respects this is something where you're learning more from the from the, from the hindsight than you had at the time, though. I think you just have to say that's your learning. We're benefiting from hindsight. No, nothing wrong with that. No. Uh, Better to know it in advance, but... <laughs> right. right? But, right. No, it would be an interesting thing if, if you're championing of this um, rule of thumb, which yeah. is what I like about it, is it's not an ironclad rule. There's some discretion, but it's a rule of thumb that deviations from it would be punished with shame and embarrassment. Uh, might be effective. I think so. A lot of this, a lot of this guy. We have a you know constant twenty four hour news. People looking at things, and as long as there's some uh, discipline in that process, I think it could be beneficial. My guest today has been John Taylor, Stanford University. John, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you. Loved it. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.